producing dye from tiny cactus bugs, grinding nuts to make West Africa's most popular skincare product, and handcrafting bespoke suits for some of the world's wealthiest clients. We explore 12 fascinating jobs done by women around the world. Our first stop is in India, where one woman holds the secret to making the perfect mirror. The secret to making this sacred mirror is known by just a handful of people. Aranmula Kanari is made entirely from metal, and the formula for the special reflective alloy has been passed down in this community in India for around 500 years. The process is incredibly labor-intensive and done entirely by hand. It's all to get a reflection that gives zero distortion, and the mirror is believed to bring good luck. Sudhamal J learned the trade secrets from her father when she was little, so when he died, she chose to defy cultural taboos and take on the business. She's carried the business through a devastating flood and the pandemic. So what makes this mirror so unique? And how is this centuries-old craft still standing? Aranmula Kanadi gets its name from its birthplace, a district in Kerala known for its rich culture, and for its temple where the mirror was born. Originally, only royals and priests could use the mirror for rituals. Today, it's more accessible, but the social and spiritual importance still remains. And so does the age-old process. Sudama works with her son, Naranjan, often into the night. They're melting down the raw metals that they'll need for tomorrow's batch of mirrors. An old roof tile makes the perfect mold. Niranjan seals the end of it so that the molten metal won't leak out. The mirror's alloy is made of tin and copper. They're melted down separately and poured into different molds. The next day, the tin and copper rods will be broken up and melted down together in the perfect ratio to create the mirror's reflective surface. Sudhamal starts the day by making the clay. It'll be used to build the mold for the mirror. She crushes up leftover pottery into a fine powder. Another ingredient is jute, a fiber they take from grocery bags. She mixes the jute and the pottery dust with mud that she harvested from a nearby paddy field. A little water loosens up the mixture so she can knead it until it reaches the right consistency. Sudhamal is doing the kind of physical work that's typically done by men in this industry. Her father became sick in 2007, and his dying wish was for someone to carry on his legacy. Since he had no sons, he left the secrets with his wife and daughter. Sudhamal's mother, Punamal, is in charge of packing the clay into circular molds. The discs dry outside anywhere from one to four days, depending on how sunny it is. Once they're dried and smoothed out, Sudhamal coats the discs with wet charcoal. The charcoal fills in the disc's tiny pores, so that the mirror will come out smoothed after it's sandwiched between the two discs. Niranjan puts tiny pieces of metal on one disc before placing the other one on top. This creates a space that the molten metal will later fill. He layers on more clay until the mold is completely sealed. Niranjan learned how to make mirrors from his grandfather when he was a kid. He came back to the craft after getting a business degree. And I put in the barnaches on a bit cool the lumps radicant or get a made a may sahai canum. Popodella, I know the lagram on the chase or any. 
This kind of passion for this work is not common for someone his age. While the crucible dries out, Niranjan breaks up the tin and copper rods that he cast the day before. Only the people who have inherited this craft know just how much of each metal to add to the crucible. Legend has it that at least 300 years ago, the formula for reflective metal came to a village elder in a dream. Another story says that metal workers accidentally discovered the alloy while making a crown for the king. The knowledge has been passed down in mirror-making families ever since. But that legacy almost came to an end for Sadhamal's family, when floods wiped out nearly their entire stock in 2018. It was the worst flooding the state of Kerala had seen in a century. Sudhamal and her family were among a million people who were forced to flee. After the floods, they came home to corroded tools and broken mirrors, totaling up to $17,000 worth of damage. Not long after they got back to regular business, the pandemic hit. They didn't receive any orders for eight months. Sudhamal and Naranjan can't afford to hire anyone right now, so they have to put in double the work. Much of their 10-hour workday is spent tending to the fire. Naranjan feeds it with charcoal and coconut husks, while Sadhamal cranks the fan. The crucibles sit in the 1,200-degree fire for about an hour, with the metal pieces at the bottom. Then Naranjan checks to see if the metal is melted by listening carefully for a sound. He cools down the hot crucible with his bare hands and a little bit of wet clay. Then he slowly flips it. That makes the molten metal inside trickle down and fill the space between the discs. To double check that it worked, he cracks open the top of each one. If there's a little metal left over, that means the mirror was successfully forged. But things don't always go according to plan. Sometimes the metal leaks out and doesn't form the mirror. But they always make sure to recycle leftover pieces back into the process. The next day, it's time for the reveal. The mirror isn't reflective just yet. It needs to go through several rounds of polishing. But first, Sadhamal cuts it down. The size will determine the price. These mirrors range anywhere from $20 to $1,300. Their most popular kind is a handheld mirror called Valkanadi. It's the same one that was used by royals. And today it's often gifted for housewarmings and weddings. The brass frame is made entirely by hand too, using a sand casting process. They make big batches of these frames a couple times a year. And the designs are all hand chiseled. Sudhamal uses wet sandpaper to smooth the mirror's surface. She applies a few drops of coconut oil to polish it. And then she finally places the mirror inside the brass frame, using a homemade adhesive. (laughs) 
Sudhamal gives it a few more rounds of polishing with more coconut oil and a velvet cloth. They always put a sticker on the back of the frame to mark its authenticity. It's a crucial step, since counterfeit Aranmula Kanaris take up a huge part of the market. That's why the Indian government gave artisans exclusive rights to make these only in Aranmula back in 2005. And with a good eye, you can tell the difference between a real and a fake. Typical glass mirrors reflect light through the back of the mirror, which can create distortion. And Aranmula Kanari reflects light on the surface of the metal, so it's believed to show a more accurate reflection. And even though the traditional process is taxing, it's part of their ancestry. The machine used to craft handmade craft Sudhamal hopes the next wave of mirror makers will see that too. Candle making has been in this family for over 300 years. Viviana Alaves is one of the last people in her Mexican village who still knows how to make these candles by hand. They were commonly used in church services and proposal ceremonies. And it was Viviana's break from tradition that saved the family business and the art form. We visited Oaxaca to see how Viviana's workshop is still standing. Making candles starts with the wax. Viviana's daughter-in-law, Guillermina, breaks it up by hand. Then Viviana melts it over a fire fueled by wood and corn cobs. She learned the craft at around eight years old. Her parents left her when she was a child, and her grandma couldn't afford to send her to school. She taught her to make candles instead. Sixty-four years later, she runs the business with her family. Me quedé para siempre. Me, me enseñaron a trabajar. Entonces yo busqué la manera como voy a salir adelante. But a lot has changed. They used to get the wax from local bee farmers. But a changing climate has forced them to find another source over 200 miles away. Parte de Oaxaca ya son muy secado. Por eso compro de chapas. Y hay agua, pues. Viviana uses a bowl as a mold and dips it first into the hot wax, then into cold water to harden it. She can make up to 40 pounds of these discs in a day. Viviana then lays them out on the roof of her house. She lives in the small village of Teotitlan de Valle. The Zapotec indigenous people have been living here since the 15th century. The discs sit for up to a month, bleaching under the sun. This purifies the wax and makes it a blank canvas, so it can be melted down again and dyed. Then it's time to make the candlesticks. These candles started out as bare wicks. One layer at a time, they pour wax over them and let them dry for 10 minutes before adding the next layer. It takes an entire month to get them to this size. The biggest candle Viviana has ever made was nearly six feet tall and weighed 30 pounds. Finally, they cut the bottoms to make the candlesticks even. This week, the family is filling an order of 48 candles for a proposal ceremony. But business wasn't always like this. Up until the 1980s, Viviana and other candle makers didn't get paid for their work. Instead, they offered the candles to the church in exchange for food. Eventually, most candlemakers couldn't afford to keep working and moved on to other trades. 
But Viviana didn't give up. She came up with new designs, like flowers made out of wax instead of paper. Regalé dos ahí en la iglesia para que vean la gente. Poco a poco le gustaron mucho la gente. Then she broke tradition by selling her candles in order to save the business. But her grandmother was not happy. Sí me molestó. Lloró mucho cuando vieron mi trabajo. Pero yo le digo a mi abuela, ¿por qué lloran, abuela? ¿Para qué vamos a salir adelante? ¿Para qué va, le gusta la gente? Her creations eventually became so popular throughout town that she's now a local celebrity. Por eso todo el pueblo tiene respeto conmigo. Porque saqué lo que... Lo más bonito, pues. Viviana and her family make hundreds of wax figurines each week by cutting, shaping, and molding. Viviana has preserved some of the original candle elements. She still has the molds that have been passed down for three generations, like this one that she uses to make an angel figurine. El único yo tengo es el molde. Lo todo lo que hacen de él. No. And all the dyes are natural. The red color comes from an insect. She still uses paper flowers like her grandma did. But it's the flowers made from wax that she's most proud of. Como yo saqué toda de estas modelo, este botón de rosa, antes no se lleva. Each ornament holds a certain significance. Estas velas va a ir para pedir la mano de la novia. Este blanco es un cariño para la novia. Y este, el color rojo, es este color cariño. Igual color rosa. Y el patito es un hombre y una mujer. Viviana is the first candle maker to sell outside of her village. She now gets business from couples all over Oaxaca and from a jewelry store in New York City. In Mexico, each one of her candles sells for 300 pesos, or $15. And they're used for religious festivals too, like the Mayo Dormía, an annual celebration honoring the village's saint. Es una promesa. La vela es muy sagrada para todos. But business has been slow over the past year, as the pandemic has halted the usual gatherings. La enfermedad que entró, ya no, ya no había nada, pues. Ni misa, ni matrimonio, ni a casar, no. Apenas ahorita que está saliendo, pero le digo, no es mucho. Viviana is excited to get back to work. Yo cuando voy a acabar un tanto, me alegro, voy a ganar un dinerito y va a quedar mi trabajo bien. Viviana has taught the craft to young women in the village, so the tradition can live on after her. Ojalá que voy a quedar este tamaño se puede, pero año por año me siento muy cansada. And she's counting on her daughter-in-law to pass it on to her children too. Va a aprender. Porque yo va a acabar mi vida. Pues. Yo me siento va a acabar mi vida. Ahorita ya me siento. Si tiene amor lo va a hacer. Porque es muy alegre. Es, el trabajo es es un alegre. <risa> Women in West Africa have been turning shea nuts into butter for centuries. The process is hard, requiring at least three women to mix one pot. The yellow paste is often called women's gold, and for many in Northern Ghana, it's the only source of income. We don't have anything to do. That's why we are doing the sea butter. People across Africa have used it for skin and hair care, food and medicine for at least 700 years. And in recent decades, it's become a global sensation. 
International customers often buy larger quantities from companies that can produce it faster, making it harder for traditional farmers. But the biggest threat is right in their backyard. For the past four decades, men have been cutting down the very tree that provides livelihood to many families. We traveled to Ghana to find out how despite the challenges, this group of women artisans is still standing. The day starts with a two hour trek to the forest for many women in the town of Yinduri. The journey can be dangerous. They have to travel in groups to avoid armed robbers lurking in the forest. And they risk getting bitten by snakes when walking through the grass. If you are only one or two women that goes into the bush to pick, it's likely that you won't come back. The shade tree grows along a dry savanna belt that stretches from east to west Africa. Only the ripe shea nuts that have fallen from the tree are ready. The return home can also be physically taxing. The women carry more than 25 kilograms of seeds on their heads. They first wash the seeds and let them dry for a week. Then it's time for cracking. The nuts are ready when the kernel starts to rattle against the shell. Only the good ones are made into butter. The bad nuts are used to make a special food called kanwu and as a fertilizer on their farms. This attention to detail sets traditional shea butter apart from commercially made ones. With the machinery, you pour everything in the machine. So if there's bad one, you will not be able to identify it. Portia Asumda has led an organization called Titiaka Boresa for the last three years. The group provides cooking pots and training for shea farmers in the Talensi district. It also teaches them how to pick the best quality nuts for their product. They crack the nuts into smaller pieces with a brick. Then roast them over an open fire until they become fragrant. This helps release the oils that give shea butter its nutty taste and smell. It's one of the skills Akunya Alehere is teaching her daughter. She's been making shea butter for more than half her life. She grinds the shea nut pieces by hand. Some shea farmers have invested in grinding mills to make this step easier. But Acuna takes pride in sticking to the techniques that date back to the 14th century. The divots in these rocks provide the perfect working space. The women only produce small batches at a time to ensure the quality will be consistent. It's all hands on deck when it comes to mixing the shea paste. The work can be grueling and takes a lot of strength. They do this for one hour to get the right consistency. The water activates the butter. Slowly, it separates and floats to the top. Acuna melts the butter in another fire, using wood that was harvested in the forest. She waits until it turns a deep chocolate color. The shea oil will cool and be sold as unrefined butter. The first accounts of shea butter use date back to 14th century Burkina Faso. It's been used in West African households as a cooking fat and as a moisturizing salve for skin. Legend has it that even the Egyptian queen Cleopatra appreciated the butter for its hydrating power. In recent decades, global demand for shea butter has increased dramatically. 
Its healing properties and high levels of vitamins have made it the ultimate ingredient for skincare products across the world. In the last 20 years alone, annual exports have increased 600%. But with new demand have come new challenges. Deforestation, competition from bigger companies, and a global pandemic have threatened the livelihoods of small-scale shea farmers. We used to get supplies from other countries like Canada, US, UK. But when COVID-19 came, we never had orders again. Faster, machine-run shea processing plants in Ghana have also begun taking over the market, making it difficult for this group of women to keep up. It takes them an entire month to produce what a big factory can do in three days. Deforestation is also an ongoing battle. Since the 1990s, men have been cutting down shea nut trees to make charcoal for commercial use. Around 8 million trees are cut each year. The quantity we used to get, now we don't get it that way again. It has reduced drastically. Shea butter making has sustained generations of women in Ghana. Today, many depend on it as their only source of income. Mostly with this group, most of them are widows. They used to say widows, they can't do anything for their own. But now that they have their own handwork, they are able to do something and earn money and take home. Organizations like Porsche's teach traditional shea farmers how to produce better quality butter and understand its value in the local market. With this knowledge, they can take home a higher profit from their sales. The organization is also working to combat deforestation. Over the last two years, it's planted 7,000 shea trees in hopes of repopulating the parklands. Although there are many challenges, Portia sees a bright future ahead. That is our business. That is what we do. Even though it is hard to, pro to produce it, but that is where we get our money from. That is where we get our income. Young women are still interested in learning the craft. And she hopes that expanding her business will give more opportunities to people looking to learn the skill in its traditional form. We like to have our own plantations. We like to have our own warehouses where we can keep our share nuts there. For women here, shea butter is a symbol of prosperity and independence. And they're determined to pass it on to the younger generation. These white dots are bugs. And there's a good chance you've eaten them before. Raised on cactuses, they're called cochineals, and the acid in their guts makes a vibrant red dye. It ends up in tons of products, from strawberry yogurt to M&Ms to lipstick. Indigenous people across Latin America traded it for thousands of years. And in the 17th century, it was Mexico's second most valuable export, behind silver. It can be found in the walls of archaeological sites, in priceless paintings, and in the robes of kings. Synthetic dyes and pressure from animal rights activists have pushed some Mexican farms to abandon production altogether. And cultivation of cochineals has been disappearing. It's a shame because it's the most powerful, brilliant red dye in existence. This will be the last time Ines Carmona de Gante farms cochineals on her land. Others, like Catalina Yolanda Lopez, say they'll do everything they can to keep their production going.
But Catalina doesn't know how much longer her family can keep this ancient tradition alive. Cochineal bugs are tiny parasites that live on cactuses. And the stuff that becomes the powerful red dye makes up almost a quarter of their weight. But it's not blood. It's actually a naturally occurring compound called carminic acid that's a repellent against predators like ants. Cochineals eat prickly pear cactuses, or nopales as they're known in Mexico. They have all the moisture and nutrients the bug needs to survive. Ya otra planta ya no la alimenta. Catalina's grandmother taught her how to raise cochineals when she was just four years old. Today, she's one of the last cochineal producers in all of Mexico, running a farm in Oaxaca. It all starts in her field of young nopales. These baby cactuses are cuttings of older ones. Un nopal podemos sacar fracciones y multiplicar. Cada penca de abajo desarrolla dos, como si fueran conejitos, aquí vemos. Farmers have to wear gloves to protect against the cactus's needles as they cut off the paddles. The spinitas de 3 millimeters que se entierran en la piel y que son muy este dolorosas. En el cuerpo a veces se me llegan a encajar y como no los puedo buscar, pues se me quedan ahí que ya parezco nopal. <laughs> Next, Catalina washes the cactus with soap and water. Only then can she place the cachanils on the paddles. Estamos anidando lo que es la grana cochinilla madre, poniéndola dentro de los un nido de palma. These look like finger traps, but they're actually tiny houses for the bugs. Catalina says no one makes them anymore, so she has to be careful not to break them. Y dentro de 12 horas o 10 horas van a aparecer el, la grana cochinilla bebé caminando a través los agujeros de las uniones de la palma. And once they've spread across the paddle, she hooks in a wire and hangs it up. Now the cochineals can get to munching. Esto la denominamos nopaloteca en lugar de libros acomodados así, tenemos nopales. Aquí está protegida del aire, de la lluvia, del frío, del calor. Y este rack lo inventé hace más de 50 años. Catalina constantly has to check for predators in the Nopal library. Predators like this telero worm. Y este se come la grana cuando está en estado larvario. Every white dot you see here is a cochineal. Tiene un polvo alrededor de ella como si fuera talco guarina. The white powder acts as a glue to help the insects stick to the paddle. And it protects them against the sun too. Cochineals stick their probe into the cactus skin and suck out the water and nutrients. Y en eso su cuerpecito empieza a trabajar como un laboratorio, transformando los azúcares en ácido carmínico. Only female cochineals produce carmine. The males are tiny, have wings, and fly away. But don't call these little guys beetles or cockroaches. Las cucarachas tienen caparazón, tienen dos antenas y son muy feas. Y estas son preciosas. Once stayed over in Puebla, almost all of Carmona's nopal fields will be gone. She plans to replace it with corn, and save just a few cactuses to raise cochineals as a hobby. She comes out to weed her fields and brush off any predators. Las arañas, los bichos. She looks for the perfect cactuses to bring back to her hungry bugs in the greenhouse. Puede ser pequeño, puede ser chueco, deforme, este pero debe de ser grueso, que tenga alimento. 
Caretakers of the cochineals have to constantly move babies to new nopal paddles. And after three to four months, the female insects are ready for harvesting. Carmona uses a sieve to separate the bugs from their clothes, the powder and silk they make. As the dead cochineals dry out, their squishy pods solidify. Carmona sells them whole. Todo este hilo de de acá hasta allá para sacar tres kilos de grana húmeda y nos queda uno de grana así. Catalina and her daughter, Claudia Juarez Lopez, use a traditional metate to grind them into a brilliant red. Este es preferible hacerlo a mano, ya que nosotros creemos que es mejor este, la molienda, es más despacio y el color se concentra más. Either way, it's very tedious work. It takes 70,000 bugs to make just one pound of dye. The powder has to be dunked in an alcohol solution and filtered to remove the insect parts. Catalina sells a kilo of her dried cochineal for about $150. Large food brands use carminic acid in everything, from Yoplait strawberry yogurt and airheads to Nerds and M&Ms in the UK. But customers will never taste it. No cambia el sabor. O sea, la grana solamente tiene puro color. It appears on the nutrition label as Carmine, Natural Red 4, Crimson Lake, or E120 in the European Union. Carmine is also frequently used in the cosmetic industry. And that use is anything but new. Cochineal dates back thousands of years in Mexico. It was used in lipstick, textiles, royal headdresses, and wall art, like those in the pyramids of Montalban. After Hernán Cortés conquered the Aztecs, he brought cochineal back to Europe. And it quickly replaced European dyes, because cochineal fixed onto wool and silk better, lasted longer, and created a more vibrant red about 15 times more powerful than anything that had been seen before. It came to represent power, showing up in the highest of fashion. The Catholic Church used it in its red cardinal robes, and the British Army used it in their red coats. And soon, artists like Van Gogh, Renoir, and Rembrandt were painting cochineals into their masterpieces. In the 1800s, women in the United States started using it to color food, from cakes and candies to jellies and pickled red cabbage. But then in 1856, synthetic dyes were invented, first with mauve, made from byproducts of coal, and then in 1878 with red number two, made from petroleum. It was very difficult to compete because they had lower prices, larger volume, and uh, similar qualities. And these synthetics just about wiped out cochineal production in Mexico. Then in 1976, the FDA banned red number two, under suspicion it could cause cancer. And so began a renewed interest in natural dyes. But at that point, there were almost no cochineal growers left in the country. Catalina's family was one of just three still working with the insects. So she made it her life mission to preserve this bug and teach others about cochineal. She started selling the dye to local artisans and chefs and turned her farm into a museum to lead workshops for people interested in the bug. Por amor a los insectos. Creo que nuestro corazón está con los insectos, nuestra vida está con los insectos. But much of Catalina's work has been reversed in the last two decades. Brands like the liqueur Campari and Starbucks stopped using Carmine due to pressure from vegetarian customers. The pandemic was another blow. Orders stopped completely for Carmona. And that's when she decided to stop cochineal production. Se viene la pandemia y se acabó todo. Last year, she produced 400 kilos of the bug. This year, she expects just 50 kilos. In two months, it disappears the space. She switched this entire greenhouse to tomatoes. Pues sí necesito este algo que me genere dinero. So can Mexican producers save their cochineal? 
the answer could lie with Peru. The government started investing in cochineal farming in the 1990s to help boost employment in rural parts of the country. And now Peru dominates more than 80% of the market. American-based liqueur brands have started using it again in place of synthetic dyes. It was even the inspiration for Pantone's color of the year. And there's growing demand across the globe. But Peru has some advantages. The country produces a wild kind of cochineal that grows outdoors without much farmer involvement, so it's cheaper. And while Mexican domesticated cochineal have more carminic acid, they also need to be grown indoors to protect from parasites. To be able to deliver large-scale orders from international buyers, farmers like Catalina would have to build more greenhouses and hire labor. But that's too expensive. Catalina had to turn down two letters of interest from English buyers because she simply couldn't produce the amount of dye they needed. Experts say investments from the Mexican government could help farmers. To provide basically seed money to Oaxaca peasant women. In the meantime, Catalina hopes to keep educating every visitor who stops by her farm. Creo que hay oportunidad para que esta cultura renazca. Just like she taught her daughter Claudia, who's won awards for her work with the bot. Este, sin el apoyo pues de los hijos, este, a lo mejor se hubiera ya perdido este trabajo que viene desarrollando mi mamá. But until investments or customers come, some cochineals will be lost. And Catalina will be here, caring for her bunny cactuses and tiny little bugs. Y mantener vivo esta especie, que creemos que es un legado cultural del México antiguo. This golden fiber is considered one of India's most important crops. It's called jute, and it's often used to make sacks for coffee, sugar, and grain. Women from the Rajbanshi ethnic group have been weaving it into floor and prayer mats for generations. Sanjita Sarkar learned the craft of dhokra weaving when she was 12. But cheaper alternatives have flooded the market in recent decades, forcing many weaving families out of business. We visited the village of Mohishbatan to see how, despite the challenges, this ancient craft is still standing. 80% of India's jute grows on the warm and humid lands of West Bengal. Farmers cut the stalks once a year during the rainy season in July. They tie the jute to the wet ground to soak. After three weeks, the bark becomes soft and the plant turns from green to brown. They strip the plant to expose the loose jute fibers and rinse it in water. It dries in the sun for up to three days before it's sold to artisans like Sanjita. Women in her family have practiced the craft for at least four generations. Sanjita pulls the loose fibers and separates them. She avoids the dark fibers and instead buys jute that is shiny golden brown. The water smooths and prepares the fibers for rolling. She rolls it across this old piece of tire on her leg to prepare for the next step. This technique is called pine, and it helps to keep the threads the same thickness. Otherwise, the mat may become uneven. Threads wrap around this homemade spindle called the takur. She can sit for hours hand-rolling the jute. While some weavers buy pre-rolled jute from the market, Sanjita prefers to do it herself. 
she wraps the thread around her legs to form the roll called lachi and prepares them for dyeing. Sanjita works with her sisters-in-law to prepare the threads. Weaving has been a task reserved for women in the Rajbonshi tribe. The community comprises three million people across India, and they make a living mainly from farming. But for centuries, Rajbonshi women were not allowed to work outside the home. So making and selling mats was the only way for them to make money. Nowadays, many split their time between farming, household chores, and weaving. So it's not always easy to juggle it all. They meet to bleach and color their threads once a month to save time. The best dye comes from a native fruit, but it's been hard to find. <laughs> So they buy the colors from a market in Kolkata. They hang the jute threads to dry for one day. People in India have used jute to weave mats since 3000 BC. Demand for the crops took off in the mid-19th century when companies worldwide began using jute sacks to package products like coffee, sugar and grain. This provided jobs for millions of people in rural areas of West Bengal. But when power looms entered the market in the late 19th century, the need for skilled hand weavers decreased. Today, less than 20% of India's textiles are handwoven. And from 1995 to 2010, the handloom industry lost 2.2 million artisans. <laughs> Dhokra mats are an essential part of the Rajbonshi daily life. People use them for sitting, praying, and sleeping. Products made from cheaper materials are now bringing in competition. Sanjita uses a traditional loom made of bamboo and wood she inherited from her mother-in-law who built it 60 years ago. Setting it up is an important step that takes precision and expertise. She spends hours looping and securing two to three rolls of jute through the loom. A simple pattern can take her a day and a half to weave. And it's a full body activity. She gets support from a backstrap, but years of weaving have taken a toll on her body. Sanjita sells her mats for 400 rupees, around 5 US dollars. But plastic mats can cost less than half of what her jute ones cost. She makes about 60,000 rupees selling her mats at craft fairs across India. That's 730 US dollars a year. But traveling to them is expensive, and she can't afford to do it on her own. So non-profit groups help her sell her products. <laughs> Her family still mainly depends on her husband's income from farming. Sanjita uses her money from mat sales to pay for their two sons' education. She goes to workshops three to four times a year to learn ways to improve her mats and make other products like bags and jackets. But 
তো এখন শুধু ট্রেনিং এ ছিলাম কি শিখছি শুধু ইঞ্চি কত বাই কত ফুট এটা শিখেছি and with the skills she's learning she mentors other women in her community she hopes more people will see the beauty in the craft je unnato korle kaj ta jodi aro amra facility korte pari bhalo facing korte pari jinish thik thak jodi amra toiri kore dekhate pari tale amra aro ege jawar shombhabona dekhchi to make sake you need a lot of rice brewers polish rice into pristine pearl like grains and combine it with kogi mold to craft the perfect flavor you can buy a bottle of sake for less than 10 dollars but the most expensive version of the highest grade called junmai daiginjo can cost almost 10000 dollars sake requires just four ingredients but without careful attention the brew can be ruined at any stage at nizawa brewery nanami watanabe observes the entire process she's one of the youngest brewmasters in japan kikyoku sono tandai sei datta node shushoku o kimeta timing de wa osake o nomeru toshi ja nakatta desu ne despite her age her sake has already won several awards 人によってはその正解がないことにストレスを感じてしまう方もいるとは思うんですけどやっぱりそのおいしいにゴールがないのは私は面白いなと思っています。We spent a day with Nanami to discover how she brews sake and to learn about what makes Junmai Dai Ginjo so expensive.It's a quiet morning in the mountain town of Kawasaki in Japan's Miyagi Prefecture. But inside the brewery, the hustle has already begun. So this is the Asatai no kotachi are wari to 5 kara kite. Tada 5 kara kita ra no hiru no 12 ji ni wa wari na no de. O sake zukuri wa hitori de wa zettai deki nai no de. Tashi ga zenbu kimete iku te iu koto mo ma <笑>一つその方向性を決める上では大事だと思うんですけれども、やっぱりその働きがいだったりとかやりがいの部分にもつながってくるので、例えばご自分のことすごい勉強家だと思いますか？いえいえ全然あのどちらかというと早く帰り
Workers move quickly because every moment counts when washing rice. Now it's time to steam the rice that workers washed yesterday. Steaming takes around 40 to 45 minutes, and just like washing, it requires close attention. あの、布が膨らんでる状態になるのが見れると思います。Promoting Nanami to brewmaster at a young age wasn't much of a risk. Nanami has been working at this brewery for seven years. そういう文化があるっていうことも知らないままこう入社を決めてしまったところはあったんですけど、本当に皆さんよくしてくださって、なんかちょっと言い方っていうかわからないんですけど、失敗しやすい環境かなとは思います。It takes roughly two kilos of rice to make a 1.8-liter bottle of sake. Many different types of rice can be used, which affect the taste and the price. Nizawa Brewery sources most of its rice locally. While ordinary Genmaida Ginjo sake uses rice polished to at least 50%, Nizawa's most expensive sake is polished to less than 1%. で, もちろん磨いたお米の99%も、え、家畜の餌、あと米油の原料、あとおせんべいの原料、100%使うんですね。なので、産廃物が出ないというのが、この日本酒の製造の伝統産業のいいところであります。Polishing rice to 50% takes around 3 days, but to get to 1%, it takes over 200 days. The process requires more rice and slower, more careful polishing. Nizawa makes around 1,000 bottles of this type of sake each year, and Iwao says they always sell out. But polishing is just the beginning. Once the rice is steamed, it's time to add the most important ingredient, koji mold spores. Koji is a type of mold that grows on steamed rice. As the spores grow, they convert the starches in the rice into sugars. But workers have to move quickly to maintain the correct temperature and humidity. They feel for warm and cold areas of the rice and move clumps around to keep the temperature even. あの、
43度くらい、まあ、45度までいっちゃうとちょっとあれなのでそのやっぱり対生き物なので絶対にその自分が思った通りにいかないところですかね。その都度その都度のやっぱりこう気づきとそれに対してのこう対応力が試される毎日っていうのがしかもそれがこう正解かどうかは分からないんです口に入るまでっていうのがこう面白みでもありこう大変さというか難しさでもあるのかなと思っています。失敗をやっぱりこう笑い話にできるまでがあの失敗。Once the cordy is ready, Nanami combines everything in large fermentation tanks. The cordy is ready. The cordy is ready. 2つの菌が同時にあの働いてスタートするっていうのが。コーヒー turns starches into sugars and the yeast converts those sugars into alcohol. This process is called multiple parallel fermentation. It's what makes sake unique. It's also what makes brewing it so challenging. Nanami monitors this liquid called mash. Every day for a month, there's a lot of anticipation waiting to taste the sake. She takes samples and uses sensors to track the fermentation. How do you approach it? How do you do 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 it? あの酵母が生きやすくなるというかやっぱり微生物も今になってもやっぱ予想外の動きをしたり逆に助けてもらったりとかそういうことは結構あります After it ferments, the mash is pressed and bottled as sake But no matter the price of the bottle, Nanami ensures every sip is delicious 私がその自分で作っ自分で作ったというかその自分の製品をやっぱりそのどこで飲んでも美味しくあってほしいなっていう気持ちはあって良いものを作りたいというよりは飲んだ時にやっぱ美味しくあってほしいっていう気持ちが強いので。バナナミ、training her palate is just as important as honing her brewing skills. After work. She often tastes sake from other breweries. 会社で家具匂いだったり会社で聞き酒するのはもうなんていうか仕事の側面が結構やっぱり大きいのであの割と緊張感を持ってというかご飲食店さんだったりとか自宅で飲むのとはやっぱこう違いますね。ナナミ ordered nine kinds of sake. But she doesn't know which is which. まあちょっと一番最初なのでまずその全体的な香りを見ながら似てるものだったりとかそういうのをこう仕分けをしながら今口鳴らしをしたような感じです。結構人によりけりで飲んじゃう子は全部飲むしあのお料理を食べながらあのまた飲んでいったりあとはお酒の温度が上がってくると感じ方が変わってくるのでそれもこう加味しながらあのなんでしょう普通に飲んだり食べたりしながらあの評価をしていってちょっとこう甘さが強かったりとかあのちょっとこう麹の香りが強かったりとかそういうものが何とか。Despite sake's legacy in Japan. Nanami says it isn't always a drink of choice for people her age.
、でもそういう人たちってやっぱりこうファンって厳しいじゃないですか厳しい目線で見て「いやでもやっぱり美味しいよ」って言ってもらえるのがやっぱ一番の褒め言葉なのかなと思います。Tasting sake in a restaurant while eating allows Nanami to experience it the same way a customer would. Now it's time to check how many she got right. Nizawa Brewery has been around for 150 years. Iwao Nizawa is the fifth generation to run it. 100年200年300年続く蔵がたくさんあるのでもちろんいい時ばかりじゃありません At the age of 25, Iwao became a brewmaster He dedicated himself to improving the quality of the sake and the brewery's sales But in 2011, disaster struck A magnitude 9 earthquake and the resulting tsunami devastated the northeastern coast of Japan 結局は蔵は全壊をしましてあの自分が住んでいる家も全て全壊になりました、えー、酒蔵に勤めている蔵人の、えー、家族も流されたり、えー、全てを失った時間でした、えー、外から来てくれた酒蔵はお酒造りをこうし始めてくれましたうん、その勢いに僕らは乗って、うん、少しずつ元気が湧いてきました明日、うん、お米をふかすんだよとお米を磨くんだよなんとなく少しずつこう前に踏み出せた Since rebuilding, Nizawa has won numerous awards for its sake and Iwao has passed the role of brewmaster to Nanami これから聞き酒能力が上がる人間と聞き酒能力が落ちる人間が同点だった場合、早く判断しなければいけないと。そうですね。まあそう思ってもらえたのはあの素直にありがたいかなと思います。でもなんか社長よりできるようになるかって言われるとちょっとわかんないですね。<笑>頑張ります。This is an ancient cooking tool called a metate. Women in Mexico have been using it for over 7,000 years to prepare traditional dishes. Evangelina Aquino Luis spends hours grinding chilies and herbs for just one batch of mole. Mole is a thick, rich sauce that comes in many variations, contains dozens of ingredients, and can take days to cook. It's also one of the most popular dishes in Evangelina's restaurant, La Cocina Nana Vira. Today, she's preparing a rare kind of mole called chichilo. But it's not on the menu because she only makes it for people who are in mourning. No me gustaba hacer chichilo porque enterré a seres queridos. Si da tristeza hacerlo. Evangelina has dedicated her life to preserving these kinds of traditions and methods. But over the years, she's watched cooks swap metates for blenders and even turned to packaged sauces from the supermarket. We visited Oaxaca, known as the land of the seven moles, to see how the ancient ways of preparing this classic Mexican dish are still standing. Ivan Helena buys all ingredients fresh at a local market. Berito, buenos dias. Tienes chile ancho negro? 
Ancho chilies are a kind of dried poblano pepper that have a smoky flavor. Quiero medio de chile ancho, quiero un cuarto de orégano, una bolsita de orégano. Sale, gracias. Hasta luego. Back at her restaurant, Evangelina preps the onions, garlic, and sesame for roasting. She's part of the Zapotec indigenous group that's lived in the Oaxaca Valley for thousands of years. When someone dies, family usually prepare chichilo together. Evangelina made this batch especially for us to be able to show the whole process. She puts the meat to boil in a handmade pot because the beef will take the longest to cook. In the state of Oaxaca, there are seven types of mole, and every family has their own variation on the recipes. Decía mi abuela que las semillas este, esponjaban, esponjaban el estómago. Por eso es que no, ella nunca la, la, las usaba. Evangelina chars the ingredients on a clay comal, a smooth griddle to bring out the smoky flavors. The ancho chilies go first on high heat. La importancia de no quemar los ingredientes, sino de irlos asando. Eso es lo que nos va a dar que nuestro chichilo salga cremoso y no salga, que no raspe. When they get the perfect roast, she soaks them for about 30 minutes to rehydrate and soften them. Evangelina wastes no time. She roasts everything quickly, since this mole has to be made faster than other kinds to make it in time for a wake. The matate has been in Evangelina's family for 46 years. These grinding stones are carved whole out of a quarry, and they can weigh more than 50 kilos. Pero pues moverlo es más práctica, ¿no? Hay que buscarle la forma para hacer caminar un metate. Some commercial chefs have switched to blenders to make the process faster. But Evangelina says that hand crushing the ingredients makes the paste smoother and helps bring out intense flavors from the spices. Nuestro compromiso como cocineras tradicionales es rescatar todos estos elementos que hacen de la cocina tradicional esa importancia que tiene, ¿no? This is the most physically taxing step. And it can take two hours just to grind the ingredients. Pues, ¿qué siento? Satisfacción, cansancio, pero un cansancio rico. <laughs> Así es, ¿no? Los brazos sí se cansan, sí, le digo, es práctica, es mucha práctica, pero sí. ¿Y los rodillas? Las rodillas, las rodillas también. Indigenous groups in Mesoamerica have used the metate to make mole since the pre-Hispanic time. It's believed to have originated either here in Oaxaca or just to the north, in what's now known as the state of Puebla. The Spanish arrived in the 15th century, and people started mixing indigenous ingredients like the native chilies with other foods the Spanish brought. So today's mole is a fusion of pre-Hispanic and European cuisines. But the authentic way of making it has dwindled in popularity. Pre-made mole paste came on the market in the 1940s. Blenders became popular in the decades that followed, and they eventually replaced the metate altogether. El metate que acabo de utilizar es el metate que le dio su madrina a mi mamá cuando se casó. Entonces era como una, como un regalar ahora una licuadora, ¿no? But Evangelina says traditional mole still beats out the kind made in a blender. Se pierde precisamente conforme va avanzando la modernidad. Se pierde conforme va avanzando el consumismo. Porque ahora ya el mole ya no se prepara nada más para la familia. Lard is one of the final ingredients she adds. She melts it into a pot and adds the ground paste to fry. Then beef broth and corn dough to make the mole thicker. She stirs until the sauce is the perfect consistency. Fiesta moles that are served at celebrations, like one called coloradito, have brighter and sweeter, and some even say happier tastes. But this is a funeral mole so it has a more subdued and muted taste. Evangelina's grandmother taught her how to cook mole when she was just seven years old. At 20, she learned how to make chichilo mole from the women in her community. 
cuando llegamos al duelo, a dar un pésame a un hogar donde fallece alguien, entre todas nos congregamos para desvenar los chiles, para asar los chiles. Es un platillo de, es un mole de hermandad, de solidaridad, de compañerismo. At first, making chichilo mole was a heavy task for Evangelina, because it reminded her of loss. But when she realized she had a chance to preserve and share her culinary knowledge, it took on a new meaning. Ya no es ahora por una, como decimos, por amor a la familia, sino ahora es por amor a la comunidad. Siento que es importante mencionar que la cocina tradicional es el alma de nuestro país y la cocina tradicional es el alma de Oaxaca. In 2017, she registered the brand Nana Vida, named after her grandmother. She exports her mole as well as chocolate to the U.S. and sells them online. And Ivan Helena's work is getting noticed. This year, her chichilo mole won the award for the best ceremonial dish and another for best decoration at a traditional food festival in Oaxaca. Her restaurant is open for tourist groups and locals who want to eat the traditional food. A metate, sí le da otro sabor, sí le da otra textura. Lo que han hecho ellas, por ejemplo, Eva, la cocinera tradicional, pues es importante porque lo va a pasar a sus hijos. She hopes her children will fall in love with cooking the same way she has. And if they do, they have her recipe. And of course, her metate. No lo sé todo, pero lo poco que sé y lo que estoy aprendiendo, pues la intención es difundir. Entonces, eso es lo que queremos hacer. La cocina tradicional, yo creo que es esto, es arte, es amor. Desde ahí. Desde ahí es, es la cocina tradicional. Weaving threads of silk from cocoons is a tradition that goes back more than 1,000 years in Cambodia. But about 50 years ago, it almost disappeared. A brutal regime killed and tortured intellectuals, including artisans who specialized in this craft. Sorpei Um, who goes by PH, made it her mission to revive silkworm farming and Cambodian weaving. She has spent 20 years teaching people how to raise worms and turn their silk into textiles using an ancient technique called ikat. In honor to our ancestors. We visited PH's silk farm and boutique in Siem Reap to see how a new generation ensures this ancient craft is still standing. Making silk starts from the ground up. Farmers plant fields of mulberry trees for golden silkworms to feast on. This was once a popular tree across Cambodia, but most were torn out by the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s to make way for rice plantations. The country's famous golden silkworms lost their habitat and they nearly died out. Once the leaves are harvested, workers transfer them to breeding sheds. Silkworms feast on shredded leaves for 12 days before they can eat a whole one. It is important to keep this space clean. After 25 days, they turn yellow and are ready to spin. Workers hang them on this structure that allows airflow. It takes about four days for the worms to build their yellow cocoons. The best ones go to a breeding area, and the rest of the cocoons will become silk. 
Workers drop them in boiling water to release the fibres. They use a spatula to catch them, then insert them into the spindle. They reel out the silk slowly in one continuous motion so it doesn't break. The outer part of the thread is rough, like horsehair, and they use it for cheaper scarves. Artisans scrape it off to reach the inner layer and make sure the threads are even. This is the best part of the silk and what they need for their ikat textiles. They wash, stretch and soften the yarn by hand and hang it to dry. Designing and weaving just one two metre piece of fabric can take three years. Thin A.M., who goes by Kran, was an orphan when she started working here 18 years ago. Today, she has mastered every step. She says the hardest part is the tie-dyeing technique. Artisans are essentially creating the images, using knots. The different coloured plastics represent each colour in the final design. They spend up to a year just tying the threads. In the past, people in Cambodia used banana trunks to do this. They prepare the material for dyeing using natural and native ingredients such as tree bark, turmeric and insect eggs. Workers add them to the boiling water. They strain the mixture to create a smooth consistency. Then dip the knotted silk in the steaming batch. The plastic knots protect sections of the pattern from the dye. This variety of resist dyeing is called ikat, from the Indonesian word for bind, or tie. When the dyed part is dry, workers cover it with new knots and cut the plastic wrapping from the next section. They'll repeat this process hundreds of times with different colours and threads. They move the threads to the spinning jenny and prepare them for the loom. Silk weaving in Cambodia dates back to the 7th century. It was on the maritime silk road between China and India. And diplomats across Asia would wear the textiles, marvelling at their quality. The craft survived hundreds of years, but it was almost completely lost when the communist Khmer Rouge regime seized control in the mid-1970s. In its drive for a peasant utopia, the regime targeted the elite and educated, which included silk artisans. Nearly a quarter of the population was killed in what became known as the Cambodian Genocide. Krum was only a child during the regime, but she remembers her family's struggle. She says working here has changed her life. 
Today, every time she sets up a loom and weaves a new piece, she feels proud. PH says the loom she's using is similar to the ones used in the 12th century. Setting it up takes one month. She adjusts the shuttle regularly to make sure it aligns with the dyed ikat pattern. She adds the threads to small spindles and moves the shuttle from one side of the loom to the other to create the design. But PH sees it as a commitment to her history and culture. Two decades ago, she poured everything she had into starting her company, Golden Silk PH. There are around five other silk farms across Cambodia that follow these traditional techniques. PH sells these silk products in her boutique to museums and art collectors. Because it takes years to make each piece, they often sell for tens of thousands of dollars. Today, she employs 42 people who make clothing, shawls and tapestries. She says it's her way of strengthening the dignity and pride of Cambodian people. It can take 30 kilos of raw wool to make a single Moroccan rug. Women tie each knot by hand, one row at a time. Instead of using guides, they work from their imagination. When sold online, authentic rugs can cost over $2,000, but the women who make them often receive the least profit. The most Fadma has sold a rug for? $600. Most of the profits are taken by middlemen, who buy the rugs from artisans and sell them for several times more in big markets. Authentic rugs also compete with knockoffs made outside of Morocco. Today, dozens of cooperatives are working together to fight for a fair wage. We went to Morocco to find out why these artisans struggle to earn a profit while the rugs are so expensive. Deep in the Atlas Mountains, there are thousands of artisans weaving rugs like this. They've been woven throughout Morocco for centuries by Amazigh tribes. <laughs> Fadma has been making rugs her whole life. She says weaving is much more than just a job. Her day starts with making bread. Besides weaving, the women here are responsible for childcare and household chores. Artisans use wool from local sheep but there's a lot of work to do before this wool is ready to weave. Raw wool starts out like this. Artisans carry the wool to a nearby river to wash it, removing any dirt or debris. Once the wool dries, artisans spin it into yarn. These large combs untangle the fibers in a process called carding. 
Artisans spin the wool two times, combining threads for a sturdier result. It's patient work, but Fatma says working together makes it more enjoyable. These women are part of the Kasper Tuznacht Cooperative, one of around 50 in the region. Their aim is to help each other weave and to sell rugs directly, cutting out the middlemen. صعيب تدير التعاون يا ويني كتبغي شوية الصبر من بعد داك داك الشيء ديال الجرا وهذا تتولي نتيجة تفرح إلا تجمعتي مع أصحاباتك وهذا تتولي شوية الفرح. Having several artisans is especially useful when weaving a large rug. They measure out the length and hammer two stakes into the ground. Artisans walk the yarn back and forth dozens of times to start the rug. The rest of the rug is woven into this base. From here, artisans unravel the yarn and attach it to the loom. This marks the start of weeks of work. Moroccan rugs are thick, soft and durable thanks to the wool from local mountain sheep. The Bach has around 300 sheep and goats. He shears them in March and sells most of the wool to weavers. Australia. <laughs> The Bach sells his wool for around $10 per kilogram. Back at the cooperative, artisans are busy dyeing the wool. They use natural ingredients that create rich and varied colours. Artisans mix alum stones in boiling water to help the yarn absorb the dye. Fatma uses ingredients like rosemary and henna. She uses pomegranate peel to make yellow. Keeping track of what the raw materials cost and factoring that into the price of a rug is another challenge. Artisans who use natural dyes instead of chemical dyes need more raw materials. And some of these ingredients, like madder, a root used for red dye, are expensive when bought in large amounts. This dyed yarn forms Fatma's palette of colours that she weaves into the base to form a design. When all the materials are ready, Fatma starts to weave. <laughs> Each knot is tied individually, one row at a time. After decades of practice, Fatma is able to quickly weave dyed yarn through the base. Each region of Morocco has its own designs and motifs. Like Benil Rhine from the Middle Atlas, or Tuznacht works from northwestern Africa, which use several weaving techniques to create complex patterns. On large rugs, artisans work side by side. The more complicated the pattern, the harder it is to weave. Large rugs can take months to make. 
and the bigger the rug, the more expensive it becomes. واحد العمل اللي خدامين كنا خدامين فيه واعطينا الوقت كثيره ليه غنسترحوا وكان وكنجتهدوا وكان خدموا بزاف بكري غادي ناخذوا واحد شويه تا الراحه عاوتاني كان فرحوا بديك الساعه شويه Unfortunately weaving a beautiful rug doesn't guarantee a profit Most weavers live and work in rural areas with limited access to transportation they don't have access to the markets and are exploited by middlemen. These obstacles make it challenging for women to sell their rugs directly. نا المشكل دابا عندنا حيت ما قارينش وهذا الجيل الجديد اللي قاري راه ما ممسوق لهاد العمل وحنا اللي اللي بغينا هاد العمل خصنا شويه التكاوين والقرايه باش نبيعوا لريوسنا ديريكت كنتمنوا ان شاء الله ان يكون عندنا سيت في في الانترنت والفيسبوك وبعد نتعلموا حتى حنا كيفاش غادي نتواصلوا مع الزبون باش نربحوا حتى حنا Several direct trade companies partner with weavers and pay a higher price for their rugs. After shipping costs and import taxes, the final price of a large rug can easily exceed $1,000. But the pay artisans receive from these companies varies. It can range from only 20% to over 60% of the price you see online. Within Morocco, rugs are sold in markets like this that can be found across the country. Janah has sold rugs for 30 years. He says his customers are around 60% locals and 40% tourists. ثالث حاجه هي الزربيه الوزقيتيه قديمه اللي معروفه باللون الصفر الزعفران والالوان الطبيعيين الابيض والاسود ويمكن تستعمل على على جوج جهات الجهه ديال الصيف والجهه ديال الشتاء كاينه هذه هذه تتسمى الزليج الامازيغي لا موزايك واحد لا بارتي فيها لينو وفيها تيسي وفيها الروبروداج قديما الزربيه كانت ما تتباع ما تتشرى في المغرب كانت كانوا تيعطيوها في الهدايا وتتعطى في الاعراس مدن دابا تبارك الله راه عايشين فيها الناس وقراو فيها وعايشين فيها وداروا فيها المسائل But the further a rug gets from the weaver the more expensive it becomes and while joining a cooperative can help increase pay it doesn't guarantee it الوسطاء هما اللي تيرحوا بزاف اللي تيديو لبرا لمراكش واكادير وفاس تيبيعوا على برا اما بالنسبه للبائع ديال التعاونيات تيديوها شويه ولكن المرا بزاف هي اللي ضيعت بزاف من ناحيه البيع ديال الزربيه بالنسبه للزربيه دابا تتباع هنا ب 500 درهم للمتر كاري تتمشي عند واحد تيبيعها ب 700 درهم وتتمشي لمراك تتباع بواحد 1500 للمتر كاري ولا 2000 درهم دوبل دوبل مرات اكثر Authentic wool rugs also compete with rugs made outside of Morocco that imitate traditional designs. Some of these are made of wool, but many use cotton or polyester. Like many traditional crafts, passing on rug making has been a challenge. <laughs> وهما القرايه وقالوا لك راه ما ما فيها لا لانتريت وما فيها كما فيها كما But these artisans say it's important to preserve this tradition. 
بالنسبه للزربيه الامازيغيه والزربيه الطزناخ ما يمكنش تنطار نقار نقاش فيها الموروث الثقافي ديال ديال المنطقه وفيها العيش ديال الساكنه جيل كيدوز هذا هو تتور ماشي تتعلم الزربيه موروث الزربيه موروث ثقافي ديال البلاد حيت فيها المعيشه وفيها كتعمر لك الوقت ديالك وكتخرجي شي حاجه من من راسك حيت ماشي غير كنخدموا كنبدعوا كتعب كنعبروا في الزربيه داكشي علاش ما كنحسوش بالتعب ديالها حيت كنبغيوها This ancient type of handmade pottery dates back over 3000 years. And women in the town of Sejnan in Tunisia still follow the same methods. Like extracting oil from leaves and firing the pottery over an open pit. But the work is tough and young people have been turning away from the craft. <laughs> ممكن ما يواصلوش فيه على خاطر متعب هو خاطر خدمته شاقه شاق We visited a three generation family of potters in North Africa to see how this craft is still standing. Elgia Saidani has been honing her craft for 25 years and she still collects the clay herself. Her daughter Reem often joins her. برشا متعبه ما لكن الحمد لله هذيك هي الخدمه هذيك هي ال مورد الرزق نتاعنا نحن هذه قدرت على خاطر نحب نوصل بها ولادي هذيك هي مورد مورد الرزق نتاعنا راه كيما يقولوها كلنا وشربنا ما ثماش ما ثماش على خاطر هو قاعد بطا This terracotta art is traditionally done by the women in Sejnan ما يخدمهاش الراجل الراجل يقول لك مش خدمتي خدمة المرأة خاطر من ديم الدنيا خدمة المرأة الطين Algia doesn't shy away from it though She crushes the clay slowly with her hands and spreads it out to dry. تعجبني الحرفة الطين أعز حاجة ويكذب عليك اللي يقول لك خي خدمة الطين مش بهي ذهب بهي لكن ما ثم مع ثم ناس ما يش عطيتها قيمة. The clay will dry after about five days under the sun. Making the mixture is an art of its own. Algia dissolves the clay in water. and removes twigs, roots, and rocks. She sieves the dry mix into a finer powder. Next, she adds broken pieces of pottery or crushed brick to strengthen the clay. With more than two decades of experience, it's easy for her to improvise. <laughs> من بكري نخممها مش مش نعمل اليوم نحط الطين قدامي ونبدا نخدم حتى She varnishes the piece with a thin coat of white clay or red earth. These techniques are usually passed from mother to daughter, but Algia learned from her mother-in-law, Joma Selmi, one of the most renowned Sejnan potters in the country. وبصراحة علمتني هي وهي اللي علمتني وهي اللي تشجع فيا على الخدمة هذايا. ومن عام سبعين في المهنة هذي في خور سجنين وعمري ثماني طو In the past, women mostly made practical items like bowls, dishes and cups but it's much harder to sell those nowadays since mass-produced plastic and metal products are cheaper So Joma got creative and designed original pieces like vases and her signature Sejnan doll العروس كان نعود نخدم فيها تلقيني فرحانة كي حتى كي نعود دابلتني حاجه نخليها غاديك ولا نكمل هي الخدمه نتاعها هيك العروسه هيك على هيك القطعه هذيك كي نفز عليها ما نكملهاش نعرفها اللي هي مش تنقص حاجه تفسد وهكاك كان العمل نخدم وهاديه وحدي للروح Today this is one of her most popular pieces but when she made her first one it was taboo بكري كي بدينا نخدموا مش ما نعملوش العرايس هكا تو كي نعمل فيهم قالوا لي حرام يقولوا لي علاش نحن قلنا لك عملي لنا هذه اني طورت حسب الطلب نتاع الناس اللي يحبوا In fact breaking taboo and tradition has been essential to stay in business Joma even taught her son the craft متعلم علي اني وخير ولا ملي خاطر هو مو بني هو 
The next step is firing the pieces over an open flame fueled by firewood. They add dried cow dung to intensify the heat. Algia monitors the fire carefully. She can still recall how hard it was to learn this. Today, she's able to eye this process with ease. And she's teaching her daughter. Then it's finally time to decorate. All the colors come from nature, and the women use no chemicals. They grind dried leaves from the lentisk plant to extract the oil. Applying heat will change it from green to black. They make the ochre red from mogra, a clay that comes from the mountains. The designs give Sejnen pottery its signature look. Rim is the youngest potter in the village. The images Reem paints on the clay are sometimes as old as the craft itself. They have roots in the various cultures of the Amazigh, who lived across North Africa before Arabs came to the continent. The art blends Maghrebi, Arabic, and Mediterranean cultural influences. Until recently, many artisans didn't know how valuable their work could be. Nozaha Skik is an anthropologist who has dedicated much of her career to protect and document the tradition. Nozaha was stunned when she saw the women selling pieces for only 200 milim, the equivalent of about seven cents. It was an unexpected visit from tourists from Belgium that made Joma realize her potential. Her home sits by nearby ruins that often attract visitors, so her business grew. But there have been challenges. Nowadays, it's harder to get younger generations to learn the craft. نغفص في الطين نمشي نشد معمل خير وما يعرفش هو الصناعة هذه تنجم تعرفه وينجم يدور البلدين الكل بالخدمة متاعه بالعكس أنا نشجع الشباب Tourism slowed down after the 2011 deadly revolution and businesses suffered في لوليني كان بعد الثورة وقت النسيل كلهم عندهم صعوبات في التسويق ثم مشاكل في سجنان بظهور إمارة سلفية وناس كل سمعت بهذا زينب فرحات runs a program that helps the women market and sell their pieces The Sajnania project trains the artisans in sales, marketing, business and even women's rights Joma joined the project in 2015 she used to sell her signature doll for 40 Tunisian dinars. Today, she sells them for up to 500, which is about $175. من وقتها ولي وهو ما يفهموا إنه خدمتهم تستحق أكثر فلوس. يعني في عودي مش تبيع القطعة بعشرة وعشرين هي كيشيركوا في المعارض ونجيبوا لهم الكليونات. 
Today, Joma, Algia, and Rim sell most of their products through the project. In 2018, Sejnan pottery was added to UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage. Now with international recognition, the women of Sejnan hope to keep this art alive. Rosalia Che can spend 30 minutes grinding fresh ingredients to make a traditional Maya pork dish called cochinita pibil. She's one of the few chefs in Mexico who still cooks using one of the oldest forms of barbecue in the world, an underground oven called a bib. Maya people have prepared meals this way since at least 400 AD. But people have abandoned these cooking traditions, swapping bibs for modern stoves, fresh ingredients for pre-packaged sauces, and manual stone grinders for blenders. Yo no conozco qué es cocina moderna, qué es comida moderna. Lo que a mí me enseñaron mis abuelitos es lo que yo cocino. So what does it take to preserve an ancient cuisine? And can Rosalia convince others to do the same? We went to Mexico to see how the process of making this Maya dish is still standing. Maya people arrived in the Yucatan Peninsula around 2500 BC. By 250 AD, they had one of the most advanced civilizations in Mesoamerica. They were sophisticated farmers who used astronomy and calendars to guide their harvests. Many of their more than 40 cities featured massive buildings and temples made with stones. Today, the cities are in ruins. But over one million Maya people still live in the Yucatan, often in small towns near the historic sites. Rosalia lives in one of the group's oldest settlements in Mexico, Yashuna. She grows some of the most important ingredients for her cochinita pibil in her backyard. Si tengo el orégano, el achiote, La naranja. Achote seeds are what give the dish its reddish-orange color and slight peppery flavor. Maya people used it as food coloring, body paint, and even lipstick in ancient times. Rosalia grinds all the ingredients to make the recado, or achote paste. She uses an ancient tool called a metate, or ka in the Yucatec Mayan language. The recipe takes six different spices and she measures everything by hand as her mother taught her when she was a child. Ella siempre me ponía a moler el recado. Pues de ahí aprendí, vi cuánto ponía, cuántas cosas, todo lo que pone. Rosalia finishes the marinade with juice from a Seville orange a fruit that grows throughout the Yucatan. It's more sour than limes and adds acidity. El jugo de naranja le puedo poner, si es mucha comida, le pongo tres naranjas, pero si es poco, con una naranja. She massages the paste into the meat before adding it into a large metal pot. Le ponemos cebolla morada encima, después lo cubrimos con unas hojas de plátano. La hoja de plátano se lo pongo es para que le dé sabor. In the Maya community, making cochinita vivil is a family affair. It's traditionally made for celebrations like weddings and birthdays. As the women marinate the meat, men prepare the underground oven called a bib. 
Rosalia's son starts a fire with wood from two native trees, the Javin and the Quitinche. They burn slowly and can withstand the high temperatures. He adds large rocks on top. These hold heat even after the fire goes out. It takes two hours for the oven to be ready. When it's time to add the pots, Rosalia makes sure to place them between the hot rocks to ensure the pork cooks from all sides. Her son covers the pig with more wood and banana trunks to stop debris from getting into the pots. He adds heat-resistant bags and soil. The pork cooks for three hours. The inside of the beep can reach up to 200 degrees Celsius. Outside the Yucatan Peninsula, conventional stoves and ovens have replaced the long process of beep cooking. But Rosalia says the flavor is worth the wait. Pero es más, tiene más sabor enterrarlo. Porque le aporta sabor como enterrarlo como la la tierra como el tronco de plátano que le ponen. She raises her own Creole hairless pigs and keeps them on a strict diet of corn and ramon tree leaves. Las personas de acá o hasta los abuelitos ellos no comen el otro cerdo. Dicen que no está bueno. The Maya made the earliest version of cochinita pibil with venison or wild boar. In the 16th century, Spaniards invading the Yucatan brought with them pigs and sour oranges, which quickly became staples of the dish. But their conquest also devastated indigenous communities there. An estimated 1.5 million Maya had died from disease and warfare by 1600, and the Spanish burned Maya religious books in an effort to force them into Christianity. Preparing traditional dishes like cochinita vivil was a way for Maya who survived to keep their heritage alive. It's one of the reasons Rosalia believes it's so important to share with others. In 2008, she opened her kitchen to chefs visiting the Yucatan. Corn is the basis of Maya cooking. In the Yucatan, People eat it daily in many forms, and it's the only ingredient in Rosalia's tortillas. Nuestra tortilla es nuestra cuchara, nuestro cuchillo, nuestro trenedor, todo. Y se puede convertir hasta nuestra servilleta. Soaking the corn kernels in lime water overnight helps to soften them. They wash them with fresh water for 20 minutes before bringing them to the mill for grinding. This used to be done completely by hand, but with the mill, she can do it three times as fast. She's been making tortillas since she was eight years old. Porque desde pequeña nos decía mi mamá, tienen que aprender esto. Today, her daughter-in-law Anna helps her make them. She puts the dough on a griddle called a gomo and flips several times until they are lightly toasted. She places them near the fire so they inflate and become more pliable. Rosalia's sons dig the pots out of the bib once the cochinita is ready. The pots are extremely hot so they have to be careful when removing them. Then the cochinita bibil is ready to serve. The pork is typically served in tacos and topped with pickled red onions. It's become the most famous dish of the Yucatan, with many restaurants in the region serving it. But the way it's made today is far from what Rosalia's ancestors' techniques were. Tortillas are now widely mass-produced, and pre-made achote paste can be found in grocery stores across Mexico. Para mis abuelitos, va, lo, se van a sentir raros si vivieran. Se van a sentir raros porque 
si les hablan por esas personas, no saben cómo contestar. Rosalia enjoys cooking other traditional dishes too, like relleno negro, a turkey stew typically made to celebrate the Day of the Dead. El relleno negro es más tardado, porque todo el día, en esas horas, ya estuvo ya lo enterado. Los chiles se quema tres días antes. But she says Maya traditions have been abandoned over the years. Los abuelitos antiguos ten, dicen tenemos que separar un cerdito para hacer el día de muertos, para celebrar. Y ahora muchos que no los uh, celebran porque existió otras religiones. Even their language has become less popular. Only about a quarter of Maya people in the Yucatan still speak their native tongue. Y mis abuelos, ellos no hablaban el español para nada. Ellos son Maya. Rosalia has been trying to pass her traditions on to her kids, but they are busy with school. Yo le digo, sábado y domingo me tienes que ayudar y ahí vas a aprender. Poquito a poquito. And at first, only chefs and a handful of curious tourists would visit Rosalia to taste her food. But everything changed when she was featured on the Netflix show Chef's Table Barbecue in 2020. ¿Te gustaría salir en la televisión? Nunca me lo imaginé, para nada. Si voy a cocinar o si voy a salir en la tele, nunca ni me lo imaginé ni soñarlo. She started hosting cooking demonstrations at her home the same year. Now, she has up to 60 people coming in every week. We let it there burning for around one and a half hours, two hours, until we have only the embers. Y ahora no, ahora viene de todo el mundo. I learned that uh, good food takes time and being obsessed with good ingredients and doing things a traditional way, the results pay off in the end. Realmente te explota la cabeza el saber el proceso de cómo se hace, cómo lo puede vivir uno aquí. Es un orgullo conocer a una persona como ella, la experiencia de con qué sentimiento o emoción lo hace. For Rosalia, making these dishes represents the beauty of her heritage and a way to share it with the world. Ahorita me siento feliz y contenta de todo lo que estoy haciendo de, desde mi cocina, de lo que estoy enseñando. She hopes the next generation will fall in love with cooking the way she has. But for now, she's proud of doing her part to keep my traditions alive. Catherine spent 13 years training to become a head cutter. She's had these tailoring shears her entire career. They're designed to effortlessly glide through cloth without being lifted up. You have to concentrate, because if you don't, you might just cut into a very expensive piece of cloth. Using a special tailor's code, Catherine draws chalk outlines to craft bespoke suits for the world's wealthiest clients. Everybody you can think of in the public eye, from Churchill to Fred Astaire, will have discreetly had their garments made for them in Savile Row. On this exclusive street, even ironing is an art form. A custom two-piece suit like this one can cost nearly £6,000 and takes four months to make. That's more than five times the price of a ready-to-wear suit from a high-end brand like Brooks Brothers. We travelled to the home of Bespoke Tailoring to find out what makes these suits so expensive. When buying a suit, there are three main categories. Off-the-rack, made-to-measure and bespoke. Off-the-rack suits come in standard sizes, while made-to-measure suits start from the same base pattern adjusted for each customer. But at Bespoke Ateliers on and around Savile Row in London's Mayfair district, tailors craft one-of-a-kind garments completely from scratch. Bespoke suits are infinitely customizable, but they take much longer to produce. The process requires close, personal interaction with the client. 
On Savile Row, you're not just paying for the suit, you're paying for the tailor. Every tailor, like a, a hairdresser, has a different style, a different approach, so you just have to find the right one for you. Catherine Sargent became the only female master tailor working on Savile Row after opening a shop on the street in 2016. Today, her shop is located within the so-called Golden Mile of Savile Row on nearby Brook Street. Catherine has worked with many high-profile clients over the years, most of whom she's not allowed to mention. I made a coronation uniforms for a king and I was flown to their country to have the fittings. And not all are human. We have fitted out their four-legged friend before. So yeah, a bespoke dog coat with a couple of those. To become a member of the Savile Row Bespoke Association, tailors must work within a specific area of London, offer 2,000 different fabrics, and cut each suit from a unique paper pattern. Even a try-on is a major event. The months-long suit-making process starts with the consultation, a chance for the tailor to get to know their client and their needs. Today, her client is Richard Stoppard, a local finance executive who is looking to buy his very first bespoke suit from Savile Row. I really wanted to treat myself to something that I thought gave me a little bit more gravitas, a little bit more standing. I'm not going to lie and say that it's a small amount of money, but I, I see it as a smart investment. Early on, Catherine establishes basic details like the suit type and materials. But she also takes time to develop a relationship with each client by asking specific personal questions. There's a person at the heart of the creation. It's not just the tailor and their interpretation. You know, you're making something that's really truly bespoke. She says the only struggle is managing expectations. Every man that I make a suit for wants to look like James Bond. It shouldn't be like an intimidating experience. It should be really like super relaxed and very, you know, informative. During the first meeting, she carefully takes the client's measurements. With these, Catherine crafts the most crucial piece of the bespoke suit, the paper pattern. Patterns are two-dimensional representations of each garment with instructions on how pieces should fit together. Catherine keeps every client's pattern on hand for future orders. Pattern cutting, fitting, problem solving, it's always shapes and dimensions 2D to 3D and I'm kind of like a tailoring nerd in that way. Catherine works meticulously to ensure each piece is drawn to scale, but as precise as she is here, sometimes the client's size may change during the process. You measure somebody and then they come for a fitting and they change shape, lost weight or gained weight and the measurements change, but we make the garments and the patterns so we can adapt them for that. Once she's done sketching, she carefully cuts out each shape. These are my paper shears. Every time we do a fitting, we take it from 3D to 2D and back again. So we're constantly working on the pattern and altering the pattern. Catherine uses these initial patterns to figure out how much cloth she needs. The most commonly used fabric is British wool. You can shape it, you can stretch it, you can shrink it. It is a joy to work with. She gets most of her fabrics from storied London cloth merchants, like Holland and Sherry, where the fabrics are often locally sourced. A typical jacket made from British wool starts at around £4,350. But some materials can boost the price significantly, like cashmere or vicuña wool from Peru. That cloth is probably the most expensive cloth in the world, and for an overcoat you would be talking upwards of £20,000. Catherine says she prefers robust materials because her goal is to create a suit that lasts for decades. The next step is striking, or marking up the cloth with a sharpened piece of Taylor's chalk. With a piece of chalk, you get a really nice sharp edge and get a really lovely curve. You tend to do those curves freehand. Catherine leaves extra cloth on the edges in case she needs to lengthen it. It's called the inlay and it remains inside the final suit, so the garment can be altered even years later if needed. So a garment that's made by hand by us 
would hopefully last 10, 15, 20 years, even you know, longer than that if people take care of their clothes. Once the fabric is marked, she cuts out the rough shape of the suit. On Savile Row, a master cutter is never without their high quality steel scissors. My tailoring shears I've had for over 25 years. Um, I've never had them sharpened. They've sort of become an extension of you, so I really don't want to get any new ones. I think they'll probably last me throughout my career. The tailoring shears are designed to glide, so when you cut the cloth, you're not actually lifting the shears up in the air. It allows you to really get a nice control, a nice straight line over the cloth. For me, this is the sort of more, most relaxing, easiest part of the job. <laughs> like just, nice, just the noise is very satisfying. Uh, you know you've sort of accomplished something, you've made a pattern, and you're now going to see this garment come together. At this stage, Catherine hands this bundle over to her apprentice, Emma Warner. Working off of Catherine's chalk guidelines, Emma does a first pressing of the fabric and arranges the pieces. Then, she uses a thick white thread called basting thread to hand stitch the cut pieces of cloth together and shape it into a wearable garment. I'm going to use the hem for the top part because you want to keep the shape in the jacket. If it's canvas like this, you will have the shape of the bust in the canvas more than if you would do it on the flat. So that's why we're using it now. But then later we also use it to press the collar because the collar is also on a round. This basted suit is what the client tries on at the first fitting. The loose stitching allows Catherine to easily take it apart and make any necessary adjustments. To make sure that it's exactly as they want it to be before we go ahead and take it further. How does it feel under the arms? Yes, plenty of Is it comfortable? Think, yeah. It's not too low. No. Can you move around freely? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. This one looks good. This one looks a little bit short, doesn't yeah. it? During the first fitting, Catherine marks any adjustments on the cloth in chalk using a special tailoring code. A straight line would mean shorten or take in, and a line with a cross like that would mean let out or lengthen. Once the client is happy, the garment is broken down and flattened again. Catherine updates the paper pattern to reflect any changes. For bespoke suits, clients usually come in for two or three fittings, during which minute adjustments are made to make sure every measurement is exactly right. After weeks of back and forth, the suit finally starts to take shape. At this stage, tailors add wool padding to the shoulders and the collar to give the suit its structure. We actually put shape into the garment at this point, so when you try it on next time, you'll just see that it's got a little bit more form to it. It's not a flat shape. Once the client and the tailor are happy with the suit, it's sent out for finishing, in which artisans attach the lining and stitch the edges. The suit then needs to be pressed to make sure it's perfectly crisp and flat for the client. It might look like normal ironing, but this step is essential to maintaining Savile Row's high standards. And there are few in the business who can press a garment like George. I was taught by a presser with, in which he was doing it for 60 years, so I suppose you could say that I inherited 60 years of experience. There's no one we haven't pressed for, and we, we currently press for around about 95% of the industry at the moment. As with every other stage of the tailoring, the presser pays close attention to detail, making sure there's not a single wrinkle in any of the fabric give the back drape a really nice clean finish and the back of the sleeves of fullness are all pressed out really nicely and then we'll concentrate back on the front again and just complete the front by pressing these lapel with edges and um, making sure we've got a good decent crease down here and a natural roll towards the end. I 
That's pretty much it. After months of work, Richard returns one last time to try on the final suit and to make sure everything is just as he imagined. I think it's interesting on how wearing the suit makes me feel. At the moment, slightly emboldened, you know, luxuriant. It's an interesting sort of quite emotional experience, if I'm honest. You can normally tell as soon as they put something on, like they just kind of like their posture might be a little bit different looking at something on the body in the mirror for the first time when it's completely finished can be quite daunting but once they've left the building with the garments and they've started wearing them we quite often get good feedback saying oh my gosh it's really brilliant brilliant and people stop me and ask me where did i get the suit made catherine started as an apprentice in 1996 and by 2016 she had made history by becoming the first female head cutter and master tailor on savile row now, others are following in her footsteps. The Savile Row Bespoke Association says it's added more than 50 apprentices since 2004, and Catherine has noticed more women in this new crop of aspiring master tailors. I think gender should not be a barrier to following your passion and your, your love for this craft. So many women are now becoming tailors and cutters, um, so it's, it's really, really great to see. It's something I'm personally very proud of. A lot of the customers are still male and the perception I think from a lot of the houses are that cutters should therefore be male. That doesn't matter at all to me and I, you know, we've proved that it does work and a woman can do this job equally as well as any man if not sometimes better. <laughs>